Friends in the room, good morning, and if you're joining us online, welcome. My name is David, and I'm the Student Ministries Associate Director, and I get to share with you some of the amazing things that we're doing in our community and offer you some opportunities to jump in and join us in serving the area around us. So first, we have in Student Ministries, we're taking a group of high schoolers to the Dominican Republic in the summer. We're gonna, or in the summer, that's too vague, in June, where we are gonna be partnering with Go Ministries and our students will have the opportunity to engage in some sport ministry, engage in some community development projects and serve alongside some local church plants. But we have an opportunity, yeah, that's great, I would be glad to. Uh, <laughs> but we have an opportunity for you guys to join in with our awesome high schoolers and help out. 
We heard from Go Ministries that they have a need for new athletic shoes for the kids in the Dominican Republic, so we're going to be doing a shoe drive. Throughout the month of May, if you bring in a new pair of basketball, baseball, soccer, or softball shoes, we will take them on our mission trip to serve and or to hand out to the students in the Dominican Republic. So throughout the month of May, bring those shoes into church with you, and we'll have a box for you to donate them. Another awesome opportunity we have coming up this summer is for our youth, and it's our Vacation Bible School. VBS is back, and here at CT, we will be making waves, and we are so excited. This is such a great opportunity to serve. I have friends today who still talk about the impact that VBS had on their life as they were growing up. But we can't make an awesome event like this happen without your help. So if you've ever thought of jumping in and serving at Kensington, this is your shot. Because not only will you have the chance to impact the lives of our students and our community, but you are going to have so much fun while you do it. If you want more details on that, check out the website or stop by the K Kids desk or stop by the hub on your way out of the lobby. Another really awesome thing that we have going on this month is we are partnering with the Macomb Foster Closet. Did you know that May is Foster Care Awareness Month and that in Macomb County alone, there are over 900 kids who are in foster care. So we are going to be partnering with uh, the Macomb Foster Closet. And what they do is they gather new and lightly used clothes and they host them in a space for those foster families to come and shop for free. So join us, K Kids, Move Out 127, and the Macomb Foster Clo Closet as we serve and love on the foster families in our area. It's finally May, and that means summer's right around the corner, but that also means that midweek is coming up. So mark your calendars for the third Wednesday in May, where we're going to gather as a community, have some extended worship, and hear a great message. We really hope that you'll join us and that we see you there. Now, if you have any questions about anything I just said, or you want to learn about what we're doing at Kensington, or learn about who we are at Kensington, stop by the hub on your way out. You can't miss it. It's in the center of the lobby. Just look for the orange signs and the bright smiling faces and the orange shirts. They would love to connect with you. Well, hey, you're joining us for week two of Beginnings, our study through the book of Acts, where we've been looking at the early church and how they challenge us to live our lives in deeper faith and community, walking in step with the Holy Spirit. But before we hear more on that, why don't you stand up and say hello to those around you? gonna have to let this music run a little bit longer. It's like y'all like each other a little bit. <laughs> hey, it's good to have you here with us today. It's an exciting day, not just because we're um, in the week two of Acts, but we're gonna have some baptisms today and we're gonna give some of you the opportunity. Yeah, you can give a woo on that. I like woos. The opportunity to participate in that with us as well, even if you hadn't planned on it. But as David said, we're in the second week of this series called Beginnings, where we're looking at Acts chapter 2. And if you're not uber familiar with the Bible, that's where Jesus has just left earth and gone back up to heaven. And as he did that, Sam Anderson was here last week, and he tells us how he told his followers, the people that were committed to him, to go and wait. Because when they were waiting, he was going to send them something. They were going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And last week, we, we saw that happen. We saw that there's this really supernatural, kind of crazy, but interesting moment where the Spirit falls down on the people and they start communicating with power to those around them. And today, we're going to talk about what happened after that moment. Peter, who is one of Jesus' 12 disciples, one of the initial 12, stands up and starts communicating to the crowd, which is what we're going to be talking today. But during this next song, which I'm going to encourage you to stand with me in a moment and sing, we have somebody who's going to read through that chapter. And as she reads, I hope that you'll sit and listen, because it's done by a version of the Bible called The Message by Eugene Peterson, which is more of a paraphrase, very easy and very practical to understand. But as she reads it, I think that we'll get a little deeper dive into what it is that Peter was communicating, not just for those people then, but also for us now. 
Hey, we would love it if you guys would continue as we sing this next song. It's called Fullness, and it has to do with that very moment that we're going to be talking about today. Why don't you go ahead and stand up with us, and we'll sing this next song together. last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Your sons will prophesy, also your daughters. Young men will see visions, your old men dream dreams. When the time comes, I'll pour out my spirit on those who serve me, men and women both, and they'll prophesy. I'll set wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billowing smoke, the sun turning black and the moon blood red. Before the day of the Lord arrives, the day tremendous and marvelous, and whoever calls out for help to me, God, will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen carefully to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man thoroughly accredited by God to you, the miracles and wonders and signs that God did through him are common knowledge. This Jesus, following the deliberate and well thought out plan of God, was betrayed by men who took the law into their own hands and was handed over to you. And you pinned him to a cross and killed him. But God untied the death ropes and raised him up. Death was no match for him. David said it all. I saw God before me for all time. Nothing can shake me. He's right by my side. I'm glad from the inside out ecstatic. I've pitched my tent in the land of hope. I know you'll never dump me in Hades. I'll never even smell the stench of death. You've got my feet on the life path with your face shining sun, joy all around. Dear friends, let me be completely frank with you. 
our ancestor David is dead and buried. His tomb is in plain sight today. But being also a prophet and knowing that God has solemnly sworn that a descendant of his would rule his kingdom, seeing far ahead, he talked of the resurrection of the Messiah. No trip to Hades, no stench of death. This Jesus God raised up and every one of us here is a witness to it. Then raised to the heights at the right hand of God and receiving the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father, he poured out the Spirit he had just received. That is what you see and hear. For David himself did not ascend to heaven, but he did say, God said to my master, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a stool for resting your feet. All Israel then know this. There's no longer room for doubt. God made him master and Messiah, this Jesus, whom you killed on a cross. Cut to the quick. Those who were there listening asked Peter and the other apostles, brothers, brothers, uh, so now what do we do? Peter said, change your life. Turn to God and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so your sins are forgiven. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is targeted to you and your children, but also to all who are far away, whomever, in fact, the Master God invites. Say you all can have a seat, but you're well ahead of me there. <laughs> Pretty awesome. It's really interesting singing the song, and I was just thinking about this. If you've heard us talk, you know that there was a lot of people that didn't see this coming. People that were looking for, people that had expected this long-awaited Messiah to present himself to the world. But when Jesus came, he wasn't what they expected. 
For a lot of them, it wasn't even what they hoped that he would be. So in some context, in some ways, that was confusing to them. And they didn't know what to do. And so that led to Jesus being crucified on a cross, but it wasn't done. See, after that, like I said before, Jesus told him to go wait in a room. And as Sam spoke to us last week, the, Jesus said that I'm going to send you someone. Part of God is going to come down to earth, this thing called the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit falls upon you, you're going to have power. Power like you've never experienced. There's going to be a, a dynamic change and something that was different. And we, that's where we were last week. And Sam worked us through, I think, very well the theology and the dynamics of what that was. And if you weren't here, I encourage you to go back, watch Sam's message. And there's also a video that is very impactful. And it, I think, communicates a lot of truth about what the Spirit's role is, which is what we're going to be talking about today as well. But I would encourage you to go back and look at that as well. But these people were waiting. <laughs> they were waiting patiently because there was an experience that was going to come on them that they weren't sure of that they hadn't been a part of, but they knew because Jesus said it that they could believe it. So they waited with anticipation and we get to see what happens. And then today we're going to see what that message was for the rest of the people. Some of the ones that maybe were there when Jesus was crucified, some of the ones that maybe even shouted that he should be. Today, we're going to get to see what message after that event God wanted communicated to humanity. But before we go any further, I want to take a second and pray over what it is we're going to talk about today. Will you bow your heads with me, Father? I'm so excited. I'm so excited for this text and this part of your word because it communicates just the character of who you are and the depth of how much you love us. I hope that today, as we are listening to this. Um, we will just know what it is that you want for us today. We will hear from you and that every one of us, when we feel that stir, spearing in our souls, would recognize that it's you and we would move in the direction you want us to go. I ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So before we go any further, too, I want to take a moment and receive this morning's offering. And first, let me say, if you're a guest, we don't want you to feel like you need to participate or are obligated to be a part of this message. But for those of you on mission with us, first, thank you for what you do. As you said, and you see the pool, we're going to have a baptism service today. The first one was awesome. And we've got a lot... Between the two, 40, 50 people that are going to take this step. And the only reason any of this is possible is because of you partnering with us. We couldn't have a building. We couldn't have people. We couldn't have any of it without the people that make up the church, which is what the church is. So truly from the bottom of everything inside of me, thank you for what you do because it's not possible without your help. And if you want to give today, you can drop your gift off in the box as you leave. There's a number on the screen. You can text, download our app or go to our website and give those ways. Now let's jump into this talk. So I'm not going to read the entirety of the message for a couple of reasons. One, it's quite long and Mel already read it. And I don't know if you noticed this. Mel has a South African accent. I do not. <laughs> so one of the things in public speaking they would say is never try to mimic what somebody has already done far more wonderfully than you would ever be able to do. So I'm going to lean back from that. But this is that moment last week Sam talked about where Peter gets up because there's this moment happening where the spirit falls on the crowd and how that practically plays out is a bunch of Galileans, those are Jesus's followers, are communicating in languages that they have never practiced or experienced or learned. The reason they tell them they're Galileans is to let us know they're simple folk. There's no way that they should be able to communicate this message. And there's all these people in Jerusalem because their faith said during these festivals and these feasts, which Pentecost was one of, you're supposed to come back and celebrate. So there's people from all different languages and nations, and they're hearing about Jesus in their own way, their own language. And it's amazing. But there's a couple of people that are not so bent in a good way on what's happening and they start to stir it up. Like some people are, are listening and they're intent and they're like, this is a miraculous thing. But there's another set of people that start to tease. And one of the way they tease is they say, hey, they just must all be drunk, right? Now, Peter, this is when he gets up and he says, no, I'm gonna address what's going on. And the first thing he does is he communicates, hey, it's only nine in the morning. Uh, nobody's drunk, to which I understand. Somebody in the crowd went, yeah, but it's five o'clock somewhere. Dad's weak laughing, like that was solid. I had that prepared and planned and you're laughing more at me talking about my joke than not, but that's okay. So Peter gets up. Peter comes to the crowd and he addresses him. And we got to hear the full context of his message, but I wanna highlight a couple of the things. And he says, hey, I know that you've been looking for the Messiah, but you missed him. 
It was Jesus. You remember that one who just a few short days or a handful of days and weeks ago was crucified. That's the one that you were supposed to be looking for. You see, for these people, they'd always known that there was going to be a Messiah coming. They were looking and they're waiting, but they had their own preconceived idea of what he was supposed to be. And when Jesus came in the manner that he was, he didn't fit the mold. He didn't fit the bill, but the Old Testament, which very simply is the time in our Bible before Jesus came, pointed to this Messiah coming. Very specifically, there's a prophet called Joel, and he was, a prophet was just simply somebody that would communicate a message to the people from God. He spoke about who the Messiah is and kind of what it would look like, and the people missed that dynamic, right? And missing that dynamic meant they did to Jesus what they did, and he goes on to tell the crowd, that prophet, that one that you've been looking for, actually the Old Testament, I would argue, in its entirety, points towards Jesus and this Messiah coming, and these people would have known that. They would have known the word, they would have known the Bible, but what Peter tells them is you missed it. Not only did you miss it, but you got it incredibly wrong, so much to the point that you actually put to death the author of life. And as they're talking, he says, don't you remember the miracles? You see, God was endorsing this person through Jesus' miraculous things. They should have known that there was something special, there was something more, but it didn't. And it continued to lead the people in this place. And Peter's kind of laying it on thick. He's not being mean and he's not being angry, but he wants to communicate the depth of what they've done. Like, this is awful. What they were a part of in accusing Jesus was a horrendous thing. I personally believe some of the people in this crowd were there when Pilate asked them who they wanted to commit to death, right? Remember, there's this moment where he says, hey, do you want me to release to you Barabbas? And Barabbas was a hardened criminal. Barabbas was a murderer and a thief, and Pilate thinking they would pick Jesus rather than him. I think some of the people in the audience were there at that moment. They were yelling, Barabbas, Barabbas, give us Barabbas. That's who Peter is addressing in this moment. And he doesn't pull any punches, but he does have a message from God. And this is what he wants the people to know. Let everyone in Israel know for certain that God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. You think that was hard for them to hear in that moment? (laughs) Like Peter had just told them how badly they had messed up, how wrong they had got it. And I think, and this might be because of my church background, this is that moment where we think that Peter's gonna take that God judge moment. (laughs) Where he's gonna pull out the gavel and he's gonna rain down anger and frustration and venting at the people because that's who God is and that's what our experience with him is, but it's not. Yes, Peter is firm, but he's also fair in telling them what their sin led to. But after he is done doing that, he extends an invitation to them. And in that invitation, we get to see the goodness and the grace and the kindness that God had, not just for them, but he continues to extend to all of humanity. And the text tells us, as Peter communicated this word, it pierced their heart. (laughs) Like they got it. They understood that the thing that they had done was wrong and it led to them taking a horrendous action towards Jesus. Have you ever had that happen? Have you ever been wrong? And if you haven't, like we probably need to talk after. (laughs) And somebody says something and it just pierces your heart. You're like, that got to me. I remember in college, um, we were having hall meeting. And just to give you context, I went to a Christian college, which is important to understand a detail of this story. And our dorms were quite large. It wasn't like 20 guys. It was like 60 to 80 on this long hall. And we would have hall meeting on Thursday night. They'd call everybody together and we would share. Sometimes people would share a testimony or about a missions trip or whatever it was they went on. And one night, a guy was sharing. And I know that you wouldn't think this would happen at a Christian university, but even among quote unquote Christians, a bunch of 19, 20, 20, one year old guys really weren't paying much attention. Not only, yeah, she, we had a mother out there. She's like, yeah, word, son, right? But not only we were not paying attention, we were kind of doing our own thing. We were having conversations. We were making fun. We were jeering. And I remember a guy on our hall, and the reason this is such a vivid memory for me is because he lived directly across from me. So he was sitting down. His name was Trevorius. And there's a couple of things about Trevorius that really stick out. The first is he ironed every piece of clothing that touched his body. Yeah, I'd go in his room, he'd have his socks and his underwear, and he'd just smile like, yeah, I know, I'm a little strange, and he'd iron everything out. But the other thing that I really remember is how he called every single one of us out that night. I remember him standing up, and I could see the look in his eyes. Not that he was angry at everybody, but he was very displeased with the situation that was happening, and he got up and he laid into us in a very appropriate manner. 
And as he started talking and started calling us out in the way we had mistreated our brother, every single one of us started to drop our hands and we put our shoulders down and our heads were tucked in. And the reason I share that story is I think that's where the crowd is right now. See, in this moment, they've been called to the carpet, not mean, not unjustly, but rightly. And they've got an opportunity to respond to what this thing that is being shared with them is, right? And, and let's be honest for a second. This is, I think this is the biggest atrocity ever. Tell me what is worse than being some of the people who accuse Jesus, condemn it, and actually put him to death. Like, I don't care what the sin is. This ranks at the tippy top of that. And rather than being angry or judgmental, Peter shows them not only got what God wants to do for them, but how he feels about them in their response. And it's this, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter replies and he says this, to the crowd, each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God's response towards the people that crucified, tortured, mutilated his son wasn't anger. It wasn't harsh judgment, but it was rather love. And that's demonstrated through what he wants for them in this moment. It, what I really love about this response is how simple it is. Does anybody in here tend to complicate things, the, complicate things the way I do, right? Like somebody will say something and I'll process 10 different ways about how they're being mean to me or how they're wrong or angry. And I just put layers and layers onto situations that don't need to be there. And I think a lot of us can do that with our faith. Right? We assume because of what we've done or because what somebody's communicated to us that's actually not in the Bible that this is how God operates, but when in truly the reality is the total opposite is true. And that's what he is trying to communicate to the crowd in this moment, right? And I think if we boil that down to one thought, it's this. God doesn't want something from us, but rather he wants to give something to us. And that's hard. In this capacity, you see, I think a lot of us understand that Jesus wants to be our Lord, he wants to be our king, but then we associate what power in our experience has done with that. And in our world, power hasn't been a great thing. People in power don't use their authority, they don't use their might, they don't use their strength to give or to serve. The opposite is actually quite true. They use it to get people to serve others. So when we hear a message that there's a king and there's a kingdom he's come to bring and he wants to invite us into that type of relationship, if we're honest, we're just not sure. And the reason that we're not sure is because that has not been the uh, relationship dynamic or expectation that we have had from other people who fall in some place of power or some place of authority over our lives. But this is the way that God responds to us. This is the interaction that he wants to have with us is he is a king who's not looking for followers that can serve him but he's actually looking followers that he can come alongside of and press into and serve them in their walk in this life. And not just for them, but so that one day they can do for somebody else what he has done for them. In the Greek, we're gonna talk a little bit about the Greek today just because it's important. I normally don't do that, but I think it gives us a really good context of what the action verb in this verse is. It's a term called menonosate, and I've butchered the word, but that's okay. It gives you the gist of what it is. And it's more than just saying, I'm sorry. Anybody ever get frustrated with your children because they do the same thing over and over and over? Just me? Okay, have a nice night, right? Like, I failed as a parent. No, right? Like, somebody says they're sorry, and that's great, but they do it again. And again, and again, and the pattern continues, but it's not really a genuine sorry because you don't care enough about the person or the relationship to change. Well, what Peter's saying in this verse is this isn't what I'm talking about. You can't just say I'm sorry and that's it. In this, the action verb it says there's actually a shift. It's like you're going down one path, you understand it and you realize that it's wrong, that it's not correct. And so there's a shift in your thinking, there's a shift in your mind and you attempt to change the behavior that you've been a part of. Now, does that mean we mess up never again? Absolutely not. Does it mean that we will, there will be moments where we don't get it right? Of course it will, but it does mean that there's this moment where we realize what we've been doing is wrong and we decide to try to turn and not live that way anymore. And the reason that happens is because we serve a new king. And just like on Easter when there was those two men walking down the road, Jesus comes and he finds us and he does that in order to redirect us and get us on a path that's following him. And it's not because he needs anything from us. 
It's not because he wants something from us. It's not because he's a king looking for followers. It's because he loves us and there's this deep, deep desire in him to see all of humanity come to know who Jesus is and what it is that he has done for them. And what Peter is saying to the crowd in this moment is you need to shift your thinking. You see, the reason it was hard for them is they were waiting for a Messiah. See, this was a group of people ruled by a king, and the king protected them. But when the king was removed, they were dispersed to all these different nations. So they were hoping that Jesus would come as a king, establish his throne, and rule forever. That they would be protected. That they'd be a military power again. But when it didn't happen, it was incredibly disappointing and hard for these people. And when Jesus didn't fulfill that act... Their response was to riot against him. And the practical application, in their rioting, they put Jesus to death on a cross. But God's response to every single one of those actions and emotions is not one of anger, but it's one of grace and kindness. And in doing so, I think we get to see who God really is. And after Peter has communicated this, he says, you're not done. Like, this isn't the end of the story. This isn't the only thing that I want for you. He says, when you've done this, when you've recognized that you have sin and that sin, that we all have sin and it separates us from God, you acknowledge and you turn, the next step is to be baptized. It's to let the world know that you're no longer following your own way. You're no longer all about making your kingdom grow, that you've actually submitted to a different king, a new type of kingdom, and you are following him. In the text, there's two more Greek words that are typically used for this word baptize. The first is called bapto, which means that you're immersed, but it's a temporary immersion, right? Like you're dipped in water, you come back up, nothing's really changed, you're just wet. And that's not what is described here in the text. It's actually something called baptizo, which means you're immersed. But in this immersion, something changes. There's a permanent difference that comes from having this happen to you. And practically, I think the simple way to understand this is the baptizo that Peter is referring to is a lot like a pickling recipe. And follow me here for a second. If you take a pickle and you dip it in the water and you bring it out, it's not any different. But when you put it in that solution, that brine, and you leave it in there, something changes. It's different. It's the same, but it's not just like it was before. The inside of it is permanently different, and it actually can't even go back to the way it used to. And I think the confusion in this moment is to think the act of being baptized and going down in the water is what does that. It's not. Baptism is just an expression that this change has happened. That change comes upon us the moment we decide to turn and to follow Jesus. We are told by Scripture that instantly God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit, and that is the event that changes who we are when we repent and decide to following Jesus. And the final part of this verse, you can clap if you want for that. Absolutely. Sorry. I'm going fast. I'm not giving you opportunities. And this final part of this verse says, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I assume some of you feel the tension because the way I just described it isn't exactly how it reads in the text. So I want to speak to that for a second. In our Western mindset, we put a lot of value in writing on making sure things come in a very certain order, which is absolutely fine. But we need to understand in an Eastern culture 2,000 years ago, that value that we have is not the same as it was for them. You see, when Peter wrote this, he wasn't worried about it placing in order exactly how it would happen, but getting the greater details in the text. There's actually the gospel accounts. Some people have tried to prove that they are not genuine, that they're not actual because they don't all follow a certain order. But that's not what every author's in intention was. Some authors wanted to write it in a very specific manner to detail the events. Other authors were trying to communicate a greater theme. And in communicating that thing, that theme, different events were placed in different orders. And now you say, I hear that, Adam, but I'm not sure because of how I read that, that's okay. If you flip eight chapters down further in Acts chapter 10, this is an interaction Peter has with people who get baptized. It's right about uh, chapter 10, verses 40 through 50, if you want to read it. But there's a group of people, Peter and his friends come along them, and it's obvious that they have repented, that they've received the gift of the Holy Spirit, but they haven't been baptized yet. 
So Peter says to them, what prohibits them from being baptized? See, baptism isn't the thing that changes you. It's not the permanent solution. The permanent solution is the repentance and the turn because when that happens and it is genuine, God sends the Holy Spirit to be our helper, to be our advocate, to move in and out of life with us. And that is the thing that changes who we are, not being dipped in the water. Being dipped is very important because it's a command that God has given us. But the action and the change comes when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when Peter's communicating this to the crowd, this is what he boils it down to. He says, hey, I get it. We were all waiting for the Messiah, right? Generations have been praying for him. I imagine in their family dynamics, when they would do their Jewish prayers, which is a thing they did oftenly, they would all pray that it would be in their lifetime that this Jesus would come. And he's telling the people, you missed it. Not only did you miss it, you went the other way, but that's okay because God's not angry. He's not judged many. He's not after you. No, quite the opposite is true. What he's saying to you is I want to invite you into this relationship. I want to invite you into my kingdom. And if you will do that, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then I want you to be baptized so you can declare to the world that your life is no longer your own. It's not about serving you. It's about giving yourself and yielding it to something greater and something better than our hopes and our agendas and the things that we wanted to have happen. You see, in this moment, God is ushering in a new type of interaction between people and humanity. Sam alluded to this last week. In the Old Testament, which is, again, the time before Jesus came, the way the Spirit interacted with the people was much different than what this is. If you read through the Old Testament, there's these moments where different people uh, have these miraculous powers that come over them. For example, Samson was able to fight and destroy far more men than is humanly possible. But as you read the scripture, it says, and the spirit fell upon him. But that spirit didn't permanently stay. The spirit would go. And what Jesus is saying, God is telling the people is I've got a better way. I have something different. Even King David alluded to this in Psalm 51, 11. And let me give you a little context just to see where David is when he writes this. King David, there was a moment where he was supposed to be at war with his men, but he wasn't. And in that moment, he saw a beautiful woman woman from his rooftop. He found out that she was married, but it didn't stop him from having an affair with her. And after he had an affair with her and he couldn't cover it up, he had her husband murdered. And David's confronted And as he's confronted, he goes before the Lord with a prayer. And this is what he says. He says, cast me not away from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. See, this is not how it's always been for this people. The promise of a spirit that would be with them permanently is new. It's something different, but it's a benefit that God wants to give them. That's what Peter's declaring to this people. And it was new. It's an original thought and idea that was probably really hard for them to wrap their heads around. Because see, even in that moment, the people that followed Jesus thought he was it. It would be the best for him to say, but Jesus didn't say that. Jesus, when he's eating the Last Supper with his disciples, actually communicates this to them. John 16, 7, he says, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage if I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I'm going to send him. See, when Jesus left heaven and became a human, it's this thing called the incarnation. That very simply means God became human. And he had characteristics of both. He was still fully God, but he was fully man, which meant the limitations that you and I all feel were actually something Jesus experienced. Jesus got tired. Jesus got hungry. When Jesus was out teaching all day and people were coming to him and he was healing them, he was emotionally exhausted and he had to rest. Remember in the garden where he's sweating drops of blood? Jesus felt the weight of these things that were coming upon him and he knew that limitation wasn't good for humanity. And he said, if I go away, I'm gonna send you, uh, I'm gonna send you something, the Holy Spirit that doesn't have these limitations. You see, the Holy Spirit never gets tired. The Holy Spirit can be in any place and any time. The Holy Spirit can exist in every single one of us simultaneously in ways that Jesus in his human form was not capable of. And he's saying, we have something better. I know it's a different experience than what you've been a part of. But this is the gift that God wants to give to those who love him and those who decide they want to follow him. And as you continue to read through the New Testament, there's all these occurrences where we find what it is that the Spirit actually wants to do for us. I just want to touch on a couple of them really quickly. The first is in John 14, verse 6. He says that the Spirit wants to be our helper. 
that he wants to guide us. Like, let's just be real for a second. Life's freaking hard. There are times where it stinks and it's terrible and it feels like it's a burden that is far too much for us to carry. And you want to know the reality? That is a true statement. People tell you God won't give you more than you can handle. That's not biblical. There's a moment where the Apostle Paul, the greatest evangelist the New Testament has ever known other than Jesus, and he says, the burden I had to carry was too much. But you know what? God picked me up. He picked me up and he carried me through. The helper also wants to be your strength. He wants to intercede for you. We see that in Romans, in Galatians. There's this section in the scripture. If you, you should Google this and read it. The fruit of the spirit. And what it is, it's all the things that the spirit wants to produce in our life. Things like patience and kindness and goodness and self-control. One of my favorite ones is a chapter before in Acts 1.8. God says, Jesus actually speaking, says, when I send you the spirit, you're going to receive power power to prophesy, power to do signs and wonders. And we've seen that in this account, but it didn't stop there. Listen to me. If nobody's ever told you this, God looks at every single one of us and not only does he love us, he says, I've got a plan. I've got a plan in your life. There are things, there are ways that I made you unique that nobody else is quite as capable of doing. And when you accept, when you repent, and when you turn to follow me and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, he will give you power to walk in these things that nobody else is capable of. God loves you in such a way and he has a plan for your life. So if you've heard something else, if somebody's spoken something else over you, you listen to me now and receive this. It is a lie. It is a lie from the pit of hell. God has a deep affection and love for humanity, and this is why. This is an atom. In the Bible, it's referred to as this thing called the Imago Dei, and it very simply means that humanity, all of us, regardless of the color of our skin or if we're male or female or any other description, is made in God's image, and because of that, you are special in a way that nothing else is. And because of that, God extends an invitation to us that he wants us to be part of his kingdom. Like, don't get me wrong, like sin is real. And one of God's characteristics is is also that he's just. And in his justice, somebody, something had to pay the consequence for the sins that we all have taken a part of. But God's response to that was to send Jesus to send Jesus to bear the brunt of that. And that's the message that people have, or that Peter has for the crowd in this moment. He says, repent and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then to let the world know that your life is no longer about you and you are following Jesus, be baptized. I was really lucky a couple of years ago. I got to go to Israel and we were in a place that they didn't know if this is where this event happened, but it was very, very um, similar to what it would have been. And as I was preparing for this message and thinking about it, there was a moment where this thought crossed my mind. And it's something that, you know, I've known, but I just really wanted to make sure that we are all aware of it today. And it's this. What God made available to those people, the first ones that had the power to speak in tongues and have these things happen, but then to the others that would receive it. What he made available to all of them in that time (laughs) is just as available for every single one of us now. And that message is this, if we turn, if we acknowledge that we have sin and that sin separates us from God, but we repent and we say say that we are sorry with the desire to turn, to shift, knowing that we'll never get it perfect, that yes, we'll continue to mess up. But if we do that, God wants to extend an invitation to us to be a part of his kingdom. And he will send us the gift of the Holy Spirit to help us navigate this life. Yes, the promise of heaven is awesome and that's a huge dynamic, but he wants to be with us in these moments, in this here and now. So my question with that being asked is this, (laughs) why not you? Why not today? Why not now? If you're in a place where you've never made that declaration, you've never decided to turn, why not today? Why not here? And in a couple of moments, we're going to give you the chance to get up and speak with somebody if you would like to do that. But if you have never done what Peter has described, just let me say this. The reality of this existence that we're in is it's a broken world and every one of us sins. And the consequence of that sin is separation from God. But God doesn't want that for us. I'm going to share a personal story a couple of years ago when I was doing my dad's funeral, 
Um, I got to work with my dad for 13 years in business and people would come into our office and they would always tell me how big the shoes were that we had to fill because of the man of integrity that my dad was and how fairly he treated people. But I, knowing that people thought that would think that my dad maybe was good enough to get into heaven because of the good things that he had done. What I knew about my earthly father is he would never want anybody to think that. So I said this. I said, if you think that my dad's in heaven because his pile of good outweighs his pile of bad, you are sorely mistaken. My dad would have been the first one to stand up and tell everybody in the room, there is nothing that I could do that would have ever outweighed the sin and the wrong that I have done in my life. So listen, this isn't Adam judging you or coming down. I'm just saying the truth is there's no amount of good you or I could ever do that would clear away or remove the path of the bad that separates us from God. But you know what? That's okay. Because God knew that. And in knowing that, he sent his son. He sent his son to pay the penalty that I deserved, that I had no ability to pay. And if you've never done that, in a couple of minutes, Tracy Henkel, who's our discipleship director, is gonna be standing right back there by those exit doors. I want you to get up out of your seat. I want you to go back there and chat with her because they would love to have a conversation with you. Even if you're not totally sure, if you're sold out to Jesus yet, but you wanna talk with somebody, if you feel a stirring inside of you, get up because this is the most important thing. And that's not what you had for breakfast. It's not a moment to be embarrassed about. That is God extending you an invitation to become a member of his kingdom. And some of you have made that decision, but you've never taken the step of being baptized. Or maybe you were baptized as an infant where you didn't make the decision, but somebody made it for you. But first, let me say this. If your parents had you baptized as an infant, they loved you deeply. They loved you deeply and they wanted to commit you to Jesus in hopes that you would one day make that decision for yourself. But as we read scripture in every instance of somebody being baptized, it's a person who understood their sin, who turned and then made that decision themselves to be baptized. And if you've never done that, we would love for you to do that today. And we had 20 some people in the first service and we've got a group of 20 some more who are gonna go before you. So you will not be alone. You will not be by yourself. So in this moment, as I exit off, we're going to have a couple of people come up and share their testimonies before we do baptisms. I'd encourage you to get up, to walk back to that section, whether you want to talk to somebody about who Jesus is or you've never been baptized. We have clothes, we have towels that you can change into because we want to remove every obstacle from you doing this and stepping out and following Jesus in this way. So my final question to you before I head off and you can stop listening to me is this. Why not today? Why not here and why not now? Jesus is extending an invitation. I'm telling you, it won't always be easy. (laughs) But if you commit to following him, if you become a part of his kingdom, your life will be better and it will change in a way that you never thought was possible. Let's pray. Father, um, I'm just so thankful that, (laughs) that you never left me when I was a little kid and thought I was saved, but I wasn't, that you kept calling out after me. And there was a day as an adult where I understood that and walked into that relationship with you. I pray for the people in this room that you would, if you're stirring in their heart, that they wouldn't be embarrassed, that they would get up and they would follow you in this step. Even if it's just to have a conversation that doesn't lead necessarily to this happening. We put it all in your hands. We trust you and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I get the privilege of um, sharing a couple of testimonies with you, and I'm really honored that um, God is still moving in people's lives and that you could see that with how many people are being baptized here. He continues to seek us, and it's amazing to me. Baptism Sante is just a privilege to watch because you see God working in people's lives. So today we have Michelle Reese, and she's going to share her story with us. Good morning. I grew up Catholic and went to Catholic school for eight years. Went to church about once or twice a week. And I grew up thinking that going to church was something I needed to check off my to-do list. I grew up and got older and went into high school and college, and I drifted further and further away from God. I didn't start coming back to church until my mid to late 20s. But I was still living for me and not for him. I was lukewarm for Jesus for a very long time. I went to church, I volunteered, I donated, but I didn't have a close walk or relationship with him. I started dating a man about 10 years ago and we got engaged. 
about eight months before we got married, God placed this on my heart. Don't marry him. Unfortunately, I did the exact opposite of what you should do in that situation. Within one month, his addiction and mental health issues that were not being addressed came to light. And since I didn't have any experience with any of this, I truly thought I could hold my marriage together on my own. I started going to celebrate recovery with him as support, and I ended up continuing to attend by myself, which then led to signing up for a women's step study. This is when my walk and relationship with Jesus really took off. This was truly one of the best decisions I could have possibly made, and it's been an incredible journey ever since that I'm extremely grateful for. My marriage dissolved, and the process of trying to get him help while also separating myself from a very toxic and dangerous situation was one of the most challenging, sad, and terrifying situations I've ever experienced, or so I thought. All throughout this period of time, God kept showing up to remind me to hand it over to him. He will take care of it all, whether it was through a song I heard, a message at service, a conversation with someone I met, he kept pouring his love on me over and over again. Four months after that, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And I was again faced with one of the most challenging and terrifying experiences of my life. He placed on my heart, I've got this, I've got you, and you're already healed. Once again, he showed up for me every step of the way, whether it was through my surgery, my treatment, my recovery, and my healing, whether it was through the many doctors, nurses, staff, family, or friends. He truly carried me when I could barely walk through it. And today, I am cancer-free. This is why I'm getting baptized. It's my public declaration of my love and my commitment to him. Thank you. We have Shelby Stoddard, and she's going to share her story with us. Hello. I grew up Catholic and always felt that Christ was something we simply just learned about, not someone who we built a relationship with. I went through all the steps and memorized all of the prayers. Years passed, and I had not been to church. A family member invited me to Kensington, Orion, and I found that when I went there, I was in a completely different church experience than what I was used to, and I loved it. I went on and off, and then my mom passed away. Um, this knocked me off my feet, and I was angry, so I went back a few times after. Um, but I found that my heart was too guarded. COVID hit, and my dad got really sick, and I used it as an excuse. Um, a few weeks ago, I found myself needing to go back. But this time, a friend invited me to CT, and I immediately felt welcomed. At the Good Friday service, I sobbed, and my heart felt like it lost its guard and was ready to welcome Jesus in. In the past few weeks, I felt lighter and more able to love. I no longer want to do this life without Christ. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> I've tried it and it doesn't work for me. I look forward to learning more about the Bible and joining small groups and building a relationship with Jesus, which is something that is relatively new to me. Hey everybody, this is Michelle, as you just heard. And Michelle, I just have one question for you. Have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus and is it your desire to follow him for the rest of your life? Absolutely. Well, then we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
so already know Shelby. So Shelby, I've got one question for you. Oh, Christine, come in. Have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus, and is it your desire to follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. Well, then I, we, and me and Christina have the privilege of baptizing you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I've got Chelsea here with me. Chelsea, have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus and is it your desire to follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. Then I, we, have the privilege of baptizing you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Asia, and she'd like to say something real quick. So go ahead, Asia. Hi, I just want to say thank you for my friends and family for coming, and God bless you. Asia, I have one question for you. Have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus, and is it your desire to follow him for the rest of your life? A hundred percent. Then I have the privilege of baptizing you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Congratulations. <laughs> You're so welcome. This is Josephine, and Josephine, I have a question for you. Have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus, and is it your desire to follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. Then I have the privilege of baptizing you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Congratulations. This is Kaylin, and Kaylin, I have a question for you. Have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus, and is it your desire to follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. Then I have the privilege of baptizing you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So this is Samantha, and Samantha, have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus, and is it your desire to follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. And then based on your confession, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, and we've got Emery, and Emery, have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus, and is it your desire to follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. Then based on your confession, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Kira and Kira. Yeah, get a good whoa right in front. My question for you is you, you placed your faith and trust in Jesus and is it your desire to follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. Then based on that, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come on, now, one more step, buddy. This is Matthew, and Matthew, my question for you is, have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus, and is it your desire to follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. And based on that confession, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
So we can get genders and knees a little bit. So this is Holly, as you heard from this section. Um, Holly, have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus? And is it your desire to follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. Then based on that confession, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go bend your knees a little. Running low on water. warm is a constant theme right so this is Samantha mm -hmm. Samantha is it your desire that you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus and that you want to follow him for the rest of your life yes it is then I have the privilege of baptizing you in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit bend your knees just a little more the water get low So this is Lila, and Lila, my question for you is, have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus, and is it your desire to follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. Then I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Elena, and Elena, my question for you is, have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus, and is it your desire to follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. Well, based on that confession, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Congratulations. This is Weston, and Weston, my question for you is, have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus, and is it your desire to follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. Then based on that profession, confession, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> this is Griffin and Griffin have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus and is it your desire to follow him for the rest of your life yes I have then based on that confession I baptize you in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit So this is Ava and Ava. And so Ava's, is it your desire that you put your faith and trust in Jesus and now you wanna follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. Then based on your confession, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You move over here. And I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Congratulations. Come right to the front, Tanya. This is Tanya, and Tanya, based on your desire to follow Jesus, have you put your faith and trust in him for the rest of your life? Yes. Then based on that confession, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So this is Corey, and Corey, is it your desire to make Jesus the Lord of your life and to follow him for the rest of your time here on earth? Yes. Then based on that confession, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yeah. 
for you, can say, you can say David. Okay. This is David, and David, is it your desire to follow Jesus and serve him for the rest of your life? Yes. Then based on that confession, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Congratulations, man. I'm so happy for you. This is Shelby. Shelby, based on your desire to follow Jesus, do you want to make him the Lord of the life for the rest of your days? And based on that confession, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Big step, right? This is Ariana, and Ariana, is it your desire to make place your faith in Jesus and make him the Lord of your life? And based on that, we baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. desire that you've made Jesus the Lord of your life and you want to follow him for the rest of your days. Yes, sir. And based on that confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Bend your knees back. There we go. <laughs> This is Lynn and Lynn. Lynn, is it your desire to follow Jesus and he is now the Lord of your life? Yes. Based on that confession, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Isaac, have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus, and is it your desire to follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. And based on that confession, me and your mom baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Congratulations. So this is Elia and Elijah. And guys, I'm gonna ask you this together. You can respond together. Is it your desire that you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus and now you wanna follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. Based on that confession, we're gonna baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Let me get right. Put your right over your nose. Yeah. Ready? <laughs> Let's do it. Okay, Cam has a something he wants to say first, so go ahead, Cam. Um, I want to say that I'm proud to know that Stephen was there to help me with all of this, and his way of telling me, his way of telling me about baptism was saying that it's your way of being publicly de de publicly declaring that you are following Jesus. And I also am very glad to be up here and do this. And I feel like I'm doing this for my grandma, you know. And I wish I could see her in the crowd, but I know she's watching from above. So yes. All right, you ready? So, Cam, uh, have you put your faith in Jesus? Yes. Awesome. And are you uh, committed to following him for the rest of your life? Yes. Awesome. Then we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, hey, 
this is like one of the best days of the year for us. I'm so thankful that you could be a part of this. But before we head out, if you've got kids and K-Kids and you need to grab them, that's totally okay. We're going to sing one more song, so we hope that you will stand up with us as we celebrate this magnificent day. Thanks for being with us, and hopefully we'll see you back next week. Thanks, everybody. Like sweet.